afternoon, everybody. Easterin Kire, author of Bitter Wormwood. First of all, congratulations to you for being shortlisted for this year's prize. I do hope you get it. I was just reading your uh, interview to the Hindu, and uh, she said in that interview something very significant. She said the stories that still need telling are what I call the people stories. This really struck a chord with me. I've been a journalist for 35 years, and this has formed the philosophical core of my writing. I think stories which are about people, which have faces, especially when you're writing about conflict zones, statistics do not matter. They leave people cold. But if you put a face, a name, a real life situation, it, it, it you know, appeals to people, it touches a core in them. And she also said in the interview that she has put real life people in these stories. We'll ask her later on how she did it. Rahul Pandita is a Kashmiri Pandit who grew up as a teenage, as a teenager, he was forced to leave his homeland and wrote this amazingly moving and gripping book, Our Moon Has Blood Clots. Of late, he has been concentrating on writing about the Maoist movement and uh, uh, Buster, he's been going there, visiting the place and has also written a book on it. We will ask him to tell us why Buster, why he chose Buster and what he saw there. So shall we begin with you, Eastreen? I, I must add, before I forget, that in November, she also got the Free Voice Award from Catalonia. Congratulations. I do hope you pick up this award too. Thank you. And uh, I must correct that. The, the, my book was shortlisted for Hindu Lit for Life 2013, and uh, the prize went to Jerry Pinto. Oh, so that it's was not for yeah. this year. No, I'm that so was sorry. last year. It's <laughs> okay. 2014. This is what but. happens if you get people last minute. <laughs> no, 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 that's all right. It's good for the audience okay. to know. Okay. Hello, Chennai. It's really lovely to be here. And uh, for those of you who were here yesterday when we had our session, I want to make a correction. Yesterday I was talking about mega narratives and I said that the mega narrative is a narrative of men and it's a narrative of war because it's men who go to war. But uh, this morning at breakfast I had a revelation. So I, I um, have realized that the mega narrative where I come from is not, it, it, is the narrative of the beast and what is this beast that I'm talking about? It's the conflict because the conflict is a beast and it silences or it subsumes all other narratives. Um, I met somebody who was a former freedom fighter. Uh, I met him in November and he said something that I'll always remember. He said, politics is not the most important thing. And I re-quote him, but I'm not allowed to give his name out publicly. And it just boils down to that. The people who are trapped, the human beings who are trapped in the conflict, they are the most important. And um, the more I've grown up in the conflict, I've grown up with the conflict. My first memory as a child was um, an evening when my parents weren't at home, we were with a babysitter. And there was shooting all around the neighborhood. And I, I pulled my baby brother down to the floor, the concrete floor, put my arm around him and said, we, we just have to stay very still. And he did. So, so, so that, that, that's what I meant by growing up in the conflict. Actually, Easterin, you're a children's writer, right? Basically. And uh, mostly, I have covered conflict zones too, from Kashmir to Sri Lanka to Iraq, Afghanistan also, I've reported from there. But it's mostly we concentrate on how women are affected by conflict. It'll be nice if you can tell us a little bit about how children are affected. My, in the of uh, conflict. Yeah, uh, my children's books are not about conflict. Not about the conflict because, no. because I feel it's not fair or right to give children conflict literature. Yeah. In fact, I want to say I don't want to be defined by the conflict. I don't want to be seen as this conflict writer. Is there such a thing? <laughs> Please. I, I'm always resisting that, always resisting labeling, and I think, I hope, I hope you agree no, no, with me. Call, call, <laughs> yes. Um, what's happening is that 
this mega narrative of the beast has silenced all the other narratives, the women's narratives, the children's narratives, the narratives of children who are abused. Uh, um, I, I mean, um, children with disabilities. And so when I write uh, for, for, um, for children, I'm trying to voice those silenced narratives. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's interesting. If I may, you know, shift to you, Rahul. Can you tell us about why Buster? I was a little intrigued by that and you know, from Kashmir to this. Uh, can you give us a comparison and a difference? You know, uh, I've been to uh, many conflict zones and um, th there have been times when, you know, your life is, uh, you almost die. Uh, but nothing is as scary as uh, facing your audience of 50, 100 people with a couple of cameras right in front of you. Uh, but as authors, you uh, try whatever little you can uh, to convey what you've seen um, in the heartland of conflict. So, um, you know, the Libyan uh, writer Hisham Matar, uh, his father used to tell him uh, uh, that um, Rome is for uh, people who know what they want in life and are comfortable with it. And uh, New York is for those uh, who are not uncomfortable with it and do no, uh, they do not know what they want in life. I think I could uh, sort of draw the same comparison between Kashmir and New Delhi. I was born in Kashmir in uh, 1976 and my father was a government servant and uh, you know I've never seen him uh, talking about anything which um, even very vaguely resembles something called ambition. Uh, he was uh, very happy with uh, whatever he was doing, he was a government servant, so was my mother. Um, and I think if I had uh, stayed there, at best, I, what I could have managed was being an upper division clerk in a JNK bank or something, and I would have been extremely comfortable with it. Um, but in 1990, when I was 14 years old, uh, a few things happened in Kashmir. Um, uh, and, we, you know, there was a small community of people there, the Hindu minority, uh, who are also known as Kashmiri Pandits. They had to leave uh, because uh, our own neighbors and colleagues and friends had uh, all of a sudden turned uh, against us and we were being brutalized and hounded out on the streets. 700, more than 700 people died, hundreds of thousands of people um, had to flee and as we know, 25 years later, they are still in a permanent exile. And then all of a sudden you come uh, to the Indian plains where you have to bear the harshness of uh, weather which you are not uh, aware of. There is also this transition you make uh, uh, from, from a small town uh, to, to a big city. Um, and a friend of mine used to joke about uh, Delhi. Uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, in, in a city like Delhi, you have to deal with so much of sorcery and treachery that I have so many knives in my back that I can cut uh, my birthday cakes uh, with those knives for the next 50 years. Uh, so as a small town guy, uh, you know, you had to uh, deal with those issues. When I was in college, um, and uh, after I graduated from college and I did my university, etc., I became, a, I became a journalist because there was nothing else I, I thought I could do. I, would, I, I used to write a little bit and read a little bit. And that was the time, and this is uh, late 90s, when every journalist worth his salt would go to Kashmir because Kashmir was, uh, quote unquote, the sexy insurgency. That is where uh, the stories were. Um, but since I was an affected party from Kashmir, I sort of, I mean, I went to Kashmir later, uh, but I sort of resisted going to Kashmir because I knew what was happening there. So instead, I chose to uh, go to Central and East India through uh, friends, uh, a couple of friends who were involved in uh, radical politics. And this was uh, 1998, uh, when these two big Maoist parties in Andhra Pradesh uh, had merged with each other, the People's War Group um, and, and the Party Unity. So I sort of uh, uh, developed a working relationship with them. And over years, since I used to work for television at that point of time, um, and uh, more than often, the editor uh, would not be interested in stories fr uh, from there. But once you traveled in those areas, you could get a sort of sense of um, the future uh, that lay ahead of us, that this was uh, going to turn into something big. So I stayed put. Uh, sometimes I would take a sabbatical, uh, leave without salary, and travel on at my own expense uh, through the so-called Maoist heartland, through uh, Bastar, uh, through Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, some parts of Maharashtra, Bihar, West Bengal, um, 
etc. So I would speak to my uh, uh, journalist friends and editors about this and I would tell them that, you know, I've just met a person, um, you know, in, in 98, I'll just give you a small story. In 98, I was traveling through Odisha and I went to um, uh, this area called KBK, uh, Kalahandi Bulangir Koraput area. And I was traveling through um, a few villages where I met this uh, uh, middle-aged Adivasi man and we got speaking to him because he would speak in broken Hindi. And uh, I was told that his son had uh, died uh, the previous week. So I got talking to him and I said, uh, and I thought uh, he must have been a victim of one of these uh, diseases. You know, there's a rampant malaria in this area. Um, uh, and, you know, there are other uh, illnesses as well. And I got speaking to him. I said, I have heard that your son has died the previous week. You know, I believe your son died the previous week. He said, yes, uh, yes, sir, he died uh, the previous week. So I said, how did he die? He said, usko bimari tha. So I said, what bimari? And he replied something which sent shivers down my spine. He said, usko bhooka bimari tha. So here was this uh, India, funny. which was an economic giant, uh, the fastest growing economy, etc. But here was this man, after so many years of independence, who was so resigned to fate that he thought that hunger was a disease. So when, when I back, went back with these stories to my editors, to my friends, some of who worked with uh, uh, business newspapers, uh, they would never believe something like this would have happened. Uh, they only knew of these fancy terms called uh, inclusive growth and uh, trillion dollar economy. But from mid-2000 onwards, of course, we knew that this has turned uh, into uh, something big, which now the Prime Minister calls um, uh, India's, uh, you know, the gravest internal security threat that India faces. Uh, Rahul, sorry to take you back to Kashmir, but you called it the sexy uh, insurgency. I remember about 10 years ago when I was returning from Kashmir, as you said, most journalists were there covering what was happening. At the airport, I ran into a Kashmiri Pandit doctor who was, you know, who had gone away, who was forced to leave, but he kept coming back because he loved Kashmir so much. And I had a very interesting conversation with him. Uh, don't mistake me, but I asked him the very uh, forthright question that Lok kehte hain ke both Kashmiri Muslims and Kashmiri Pandits Kashmiri log makkar hote, you mentioned treachery and knives in Delhi. Kashmiri log makkar hote. He said something very interesting. Makkar is treacherous. He said, Kashmiri log makkar nahi hai, unhe makkar bana diya gaya hai. Circumstances. What would you say to that? Well, uh, I mean, it's partially true and pa uh, partially untrue because now if you look at uh, what Kashmir is going through, it, it has become like a cottage industry where it is in everybody's interest to make sure uh, that this conflict remains alive. Uh, simply because there's a lot of money involved. Uh, but in 1990 when it happened, it happened because of something else and we should not shy away from saying the truth. The truth is that a few boys went across the border mm -hmm. and uh, came back with arms. But that uh, so-called secessionist movement would not have been possible um, if, there was a, if there was not a significant number of uh, population from the majority committee who would not have uh, taken part in the brutalization and hounding of the minority community as it happens anywhere else in Rwanda, Bosnia or anywhere else. Uh, so, so these are two essentially. Uh, that is where the difference lies. Of course, now it has come out of their, you know, it's been snatched out of their hands because when other players, multiplayer play players, uh, part start participating in this uh, uh, conflict, okay. as it happens in any other conflict zone, then it is out of your hands. Okay. Now, the army, the separatist groups, the politicians, um, everyone has a, everyone has a stake in that okay. conflict, and they're making sure that it stays the way it is. Okay. As in Kashmir, I have traveled to Nagaland also. I was lucky enough to do that in 1997, soon after I joined Business Line. And I was shocked to find people there saying, you Indians, please go back and tell Indians, you know, you should not be doing this. I knew about the sense of alienation in Kashmir, but it came as a rude shock to me way back in 1997 to find that the people of Nagaland were so alienated. You may not like to be called a conflict writer, but the fact remains that, you know, conflict, it is a conflict-ridden region. Do you feel that, how often, you live in Norway now, how often do you go back home, and do you still see that sense of alienation there today, in Nagaland? Or do you think things have improved in the last 15 years? 
That's a lot of questions, and um, I have to go back to the 1950s, because um, those are called the dark 50s, and that's when uh, the, we call it the occupation of the Naga Hills. That began uh, right after the Indian independence. Um, it, it was, but if we go back to history, it was the British who um, refused the Naga applications and requests to be left alone. And they divided the Naga Hills into half, gave half to Burma, half to India. So, um, um, they, and, and after that, um, India further divided its Naga half. Th that's why we have ethnic trouble now, happening just a few weeks ago between the uh, Karbiang Long in Assam uh, and, and the Nagas, whose ancestral lands are in Assam but have been divided by Indian maps. Okay, um, I'm, I'm straying a bit, but um, there was uh, a, a terrible military occupation of the Naga Hills. There was torture, rapes, burned villages, killings of, my, my uh, statistics uh, informants tell me there were 200,000 civilians killed. So this has alienated people and this has created otherization for us um, when, when we were growing up in the 60s. The Indian soldier was the other. And for him, he came in thinking that we were the other. So otherization has been there and the violence has just continued it. But, but I also want to add, I'm very happy that, though I say that I don't want to be seen as a conflict writer, I'm very happy that I wrote Bitter Wormwood because it's a book about um, forgiveness, understanding, and love. And, and I've gotten many Healing. soldier friends now. Yes. Who, That's interesting. Wow. <laughs> I'm That's just so, so proud of them because they read it, they understand it. It's not one story, it's two stories. It's a story of an Indian soldier, it's a story of a Naga soldier, you hear both their stories. So um, my, my soldier friends, they call me Didi, and they come and touch my feet, and then they say, now I understand it, and they, they share it with their other friends. So when you talk to them, you find they are human too. It's very interesting the point you raised about the Indian army. Whether it is Kashmir or Nagaland or other uh, zones, where the army has a strong presence, See, the people are not, they're caught between the army on the one side and the insurgents, militants, extremists, terrorists, whatever you call them. In Nagaland in 1997, people told me that as soon as they get their salary, before they take it home to their wives, they have to pay their taxes to the insurgents because those people are there at their gates. Is it still happening? Yes, and I also want to mention that um, we don't use the word insurgency. We don't. We, in the beginning, there were not insurgents yes. because we were occupied by India. Okay. And then the conflict metamorphosed. So it, it sort of mutated and it's become this ugly thing. And that was because in the 70s, there was a divide and rule um, project that very successfully divided the, the freedom fighters yes. and uh, infighting began. Okay. And then all these ugly things came and, and the cause com was completely destroyed by that. Rahul, I'd like to come back to Kashmir. Same thing about the Indian Army. And you said earlier that what happened in 1990, the ethnic cleansing, as it were, wouldn't have happened but for the, some support from the locals who went across the border and got trained. But would you not Not only them, but others. Others, OK. So but your, wouldn't you your agree? former friends, neighbors, colleagues. Absolutely. But wouldn't you agree that ordinary people are caught on the one side between you know the, insurgent, the militants and on the other hand with the army. I have interviewed young women in Srinagar who have said that midnight knocks on their door by the paramilitary uh, people, the military people, the, you know, all CRPF, all kinds of military characters were there. And they said that when there was a knock on the door at midnight, they would just go to the first floor with knives, with sharp kitchen knives in their hand, saying if there is, if he attempts to rape me, I'll kill myself. Is that still happening? Uh well, this is a question, you know, uh, this is a question I get of, often asked uh, at uh, yeah. such events. Uh, that what about the brutality of the Indian Army or the security forces uh, or the pain that uh, the people who were left behind in Kashmir uh, had, to go, had to go through in the last uh, 23, 24 years? To which my answer is that, you know, the, these pains have a right to coexist separately. My pain has nothing got to do with 
uh, what the uh, Kashmiri awam is uh, facing uh, in, in Kashmir Valley. Of course, there are some legitimate grievances, as I mentioned before. Um, there are forced disappearances. There is this issue of uh, uh, mass graves. There are, uh, there are women who have become uh, what is, uh, for a lack of a better word, called half-widows. Yes. Uh, those who are married and they don't know whether their husbands have gone, whether they are dead or alive. Yes. Uh, some terrible uh, incidents of human rights violations, which I have covered as a journalist, etc. So these, but that has got nothing to, to, to do with what happened to uh, the Kashmiri Hindus yes. um, in, the, in the winter, harsh winter of uh, 1990. Um, and that is the distinction, that is one reason why I chose to wrote my recent book. Okay. Because for the media and the, uh, especially the Western media, it has largely remained a, a black and white story, whereas this one set of people who have been brutalized by the Indian state, and uh, I mean, right, rightly so. But what they forget or choose to ignore at times is also the fact that is this, the same set of people have brutalized another set of people yes, who happen to be Kashmiri Hindus in this case. So that distinction has to be made very clear. Just like Palestine and Israel. Absol absolutely. I mean, the Jews, where are the receiving end? And see what's happening there. And this happens in conflict zones all the time. But I'd like to ask both. But in this case, the Kashmiri Pandits had no role to play in the brutalization of uh, the majority community. Okay. Uh, you know, now, that, that, that was a fight between the Indian state and, and uh, Kashmiris, yes. the Muslims. Now, how, I'd like to ask this question to both of you. How do you see the future panning out? The Kashmiri Pandits have a huge grievance that nobody has bothered to look at their plight. The government has done nothing to ensure that they return. When I talk to the Kashmiri Muslims and their leaders especially, they're very sugar-coated tongues. They say, Are, humare bhai aajaya wapas. You know, we, we will welcome them with open arms. Do you see that happening? Uh, well, not at all, uh, frankly. Uh, because um, there's been this extreme denial mm. uh, in the last quarter of a century about the circumstances uh, that has led to the exodus of uh, Kashmiri Pandits. The, uh, the significant number of uh, people in uh, Kashmir are still in extreme denial mode. So for us, the bigger betrayal than the exodus of 1990 uh, has been this uh, denial that, uh, you know, we're not responsible for what happened to you um, in 1990. But having said that, as a journalist, you know, there are um, certain portions uh, of people, you know, portion of people in uh, Kashmir who have got more radicalized than ever. Uh, so that is, that is one uh, problem area. And as we know, after 9-11, the jihad, as, as we call it, is not something which is localized now. So something which is happening in Kashmir uh, may affect uh, California tomorrow or the rest of India. It's like a, it's, these are like small patches of cancer, really. Uh, so that is what India is uh, already facing uh, in, in many, many ways. But also, I also believe as a journalist that the truth, that the time has come, at least as, as far as Kashmir is concerned, to have some kind of truth and reconciliation. Okay. Uh, because the militancy is more or less over. The, it has been crushed. Uh, uh, by, by the by the JNK police especially local oh, uh, local local yes, yes absolutely absolutely okay. from 2000 onwards all the major operations insurgency operations done in uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir yeah. have been done by local Kashmiri Muslim officers okay. really brilliant really yeah. brilliant officers who know the area that is how policing works yes. you know when, when you have to crash that's what you saw in Punjab as well so that's uh, that's what because an outsider will never understand so that is what the police has done. Now the time is set for a dialogue. But that dialogue, I'm afraid, is not going to be possible unless there's a complete consensus on the circumstances that led to the exodus of Kashmiri Pandits. So till the majority community in Kashmir is uh, uh, you know, in a denial, that reconciliation, I'm afraid, is not going to be possible. Easter in two short questions. One is, you know, how do you see the... You talked about healing in your interview and here. Do you see that happening? And the second thing is that you belong to this uh, band, mm -hmm. jazz. What kind of a place, because in the Northeast, music is very important. Mm -hmm. What kind of a part does music, poetry, writing, you know, the arts, play in such conflict zones? How, what is the importance when, when you talk about healing and reconciliation? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a difficult question, but I'm hopeful because uh, there, there has been a lot of people movements uh, one was the uh, Forum for Reconciliation, and that's a group of people going around getting the 
different groups to reconcile with each other, and they're working for peace, and it is happening because the number of killings has come down. Then there is the ACAUT, that's a, a, um, it started on Facebook, and then it, it just grew and grew into thousands of people wanting change, wanting to remove corruption amongst the ministers, and just wanting peace for the, for the community. And that's, the numbers are just increasing. So, so that's very, very hopeful. So I do see a hopeful uh, future for, for my land. And um, children and, um, and youngsters are not interested in politics. They just want a peaceful life. And, and that's a beautiful dream, and that's a dream that I wish for, for them. And then um, your question about uh, poetry, yes, and music, it's, it's I see it as uh, significant, as relevant, because um, if, if you cannot talk to the people with, um, with guns, <laughs> you, you can talk to them with poems, and if you want, I can read a poem that I'd like to dedicate to these uh, beautiful people here. And uh, please join our struggle because we're trying to remove something called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And that's older than me. And I am old, so it's not fair that that um, section of people should live under that. But um, this is the poem that I want to give you. It's called Love Song. I love to watch when Larsh and Petya look into each other's eyes. Oh, if I could bottle that exchange of utter trust and tenderness and send it round the world. Soldiers would put down their guns and tanks would come to a standstill in a heap of ruins and forgotten hate. Oh, beautiful. Very beautiful. One, one thing I must add, just sure, before we throw, sure, um, sure. uh, you know, from a journalistic point of view, um, Kashmir has got a fairly large number of journalists reporting uh, f from 90 onwards, or for that matter, uh, the Red Corridor. But one area which has been completely neglected, uh, especially by the mainstream media, uh, or one area which has just got sort of erased from the national consciousness is 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 the Northeast. Uh, that's the only area in independent uh, India where the Indian state used the Air Force against its own people. If you look at what is happening in a place called Manipur, uh, where you have these long blockades going on for months, if you have a small dharna in Delhi or Mumbai, uh, you know, it will catch headlines for days because, uh, you know, the people will suffer. But here is this state, here is this region, here are these people who are under constant blockade for not days, for not weeks, for months. And there's not an iota of repertage uh, f f from anywhere. There are people who are suffering f for the lack of oxygen cylinders. There is no electricity in hospitals. No operations can be done. A gas cylinder is sold in black for thousands of rupees, 10,000 rupees, 20,000 rupees, because there's absolutely dearth. The ATMs won't function for more than a few hours. And it does not find any mention um, in, in, in the media or in the national consciousness of this country. Very well put, Rahul. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. I'd like this to be a participative session. So can we please have uh, questions? Introduce yourself and short questions. Please, no lectures. Uh, this is uh, straight to Mr. Rahul about the last um, uh, thing he was talking. I was sub about to ask him anyway. Uh, he's a Kashmiri pundit himself, and how subjective his reporting would be about his conflict zone as a journal. And anyway, I'm glad that he's empathizing with uh, the Naga uh, and uh, the northeastern states not getting enough reportage. And uh, as a journal from another state, uh, you can uh, set the ball rolling and you can bring the consciousness to other non-reporting journals. Not necessarily electronic media, even print media can do because better… Uh, okay, let him answer now. So, sorry, I didn't get your question. Uh, you were uh, talking how, about… How uh, objective will ah, you Ah, all right, all right. See, but my, the book uh, which deals with the exodus of Kashmiri Pandits is essentially a memoir and part reportage. Uh, so, it essentially deals with my own journey, uh, what I saw as a 14-year-old boy who was hounded out of 
uh, his home from a land where his ancestors had lived for thousands of years. Um, uh, but I was also aware, because I was writing it after a long time, uh, I was also aware of two things, that memory can be quite slippery. So everything that has been written in this book um, ha has been validated and revalidated uh, uh, many times because, if, uh, you know, I also happen to be a journalist. I was also very conscious of the fact that when this book comes out, it will ang anger many uh, and it will have to pass through a very uh, strict uh, scrutiny. And whatever I write, it, in fact, at various places, um, I've sort of, uh, you, you know, underlaid certain aspects because I was not sure of it. So whatever has been written in this book is, has been written with extreme strict journalistic regimen and nothing else. Yes, I mean, in our, in our little ways, uh, you, you know, there's a, there, are, there are a handful of journalists uh, who are not necessarily from this region but are reporting from elsewhere. I know um, uh, a couple of very, uh, three, three, four very good journalists. My uh, colleague uh, Anubha from the CNN IBN, she, she, she does some uh, brilliant job uh, uh, from Manipur, for, for example. I wrote my first book. Um, uh, with my friend Neelish Mishra, who happened to be working with Hindustan Times at that point of time. Uh, we wrote this book called The Absent State, which involves about 40,000 kilometers of uh, on-ground reportage from uh, all these conflict zones, including Northeast. So uh, it's not enough, uh, uh, like I said, because it's like a small grain in a, you know, uh, in an area where there are so many stories to tell, especially when these stories have been ignored for so many uh, decades. So I'm I'm hopeful that the younger generation of uh, journalists, um, uh, because now it's slightly easy because of social uh, media networks and uh, um, many other uh, luxuries, uh, it, it is slightly easier to report from such areas. And I'm hoping that they'll come forward and report from these areas. Okay. Uh, my name is Ashok Mirza. I belong to JNK. I'm a uh, uh, pandit, of course, but. I live in, in uh, Chennai for 32 years, so I am uh, more of a Bram Tam now. Tam Bram. <laughs> no, no, Bram, Bram Tam. Okay. I started as a Bram, I became okay. a Tam. So, okay. the uh, Rahul, your book is brilliant, and I have already bought probably 20 plus copies to distribute amongst my friends in Tamil Nadu, and okay. who then got an appreciation of what our pain must have been like and what it really meant to the people. Well, forget what they read in the newspaper. Uh, my strong belief is that we Kashmiri Pandits have failed completely in the leadership department because we have absolutely no leadership even from the time that we were in a position of strength when in the 50s and the 60s the Kashmiri Hindus or the minority community today was actually ruling the state in terms of running the state, not ruling the state, because voting was done on a different basis. But we have never produced a leader who could represent our views to Delhi, who could represent our views within the state or whatever facilities. So our failure has been leadership. So when I look at that and I think going forward also, we will probably have the same problem till we do not have a leadership and even we get into reconciliatory mode now with the Indian government, because they don't have too much time for us. Remember that. Even when we get in the reconciliatory mode, without a strong leadership amongst the pundits, we will not achieve any of these objectives that we all dream of. We are great survivors when we all done well for ourselves, but we will not achieve the dream okay. till we have a strong leader. Thank you. Actually, it's interesting. When I write about Indian Muslims, I always say that the Indian Muslim community greatly lacks any purposeful leadership. It's interesting to see that a oh, much, much smaller minority suffers from the same uh, problem. Any questions for Easterin now? I need to know, what is the core reason behind all this problem? Uh, you'll have to read my book for, <laughs> to get the answer. Uh, I don't know, Madam. Book. No, no, the, I'm not talking about the incidents. I'm talking about the core reason behind this. Behind no, what? Behind, behind see, what? every person has a drive, right? Yeah. Every situation has a drive. So what was the drive for all the happenings uh, he went through or you went through? Because I feel very terrible when you say that you Indians in the Nagaland is from distance, which is our country, which is our state. Mm -hmm. And now, and uh, it is very odd actually to listen to say, and you're like as if some from, from another country, but you are an Indian. Yes. And yet, you know, uh, everyone is saying that, you know, you and the you Indian, it's a differentiated. So what is the belief? What is the core reason behind all this problem? 
you know, uh, when I came to um, Delhi airport, landed in Delhi airport, and I was stand standing in the line for people with Indian passports, the customs officer kept shouting at me, said, go, there, go out, go out, go to the foreigner's line. <laughs> this is only for Indians, he said. So I waved my blue Indian passport, I said, I'm Indian. <laughs> so that was the first time actually in my life that I said, I'm an Indian. So the belief is wrong. But, you know, the, uh, what I'm talking about is historically true. And I, I am saying that the Naga Hills were occupied by India and Burma. And this was a doing of the British government that they, they, they uh, were the colonial power, they were leaving, they did not heed the Naga's wish to be left alone. And instead they cut up our lands, gave half to Burma, half to India. And that has started all the trouble. And when we resisted being occupied by India, the Nehru government sent in troops. At one point, there were five, uh, one soldier for every five Nagas. And the torture began, the Amen. groupings began. So the alienation and, and all the uh, conflict is because of that. But I really recommend that you read my book because this is, this is a question I can't just answer from here. It's, T too long an answer. It's, it's, it's basically a yearning for independence. Ah, yes, ma'am. So yeah. it's an indigen belief, right? Yes. So the belief was wrong. Okay, thanks. My question is to both of you. And uh, it's a slight change of pace here. I'd like to know what challenges in the instrument, in the, in the mechanics of writing that you feel when you have to write a book about um, such conflict zones because it certainly cannot be an enumeration of the events because that would be a very dry incidence. You certainly cannot fictionalize it. So I was wondering how your people actually handle that situation. Well, I think um, uh, th that's, that, that's a skill set you learn as a journalist as you, uh, as you go by. There are, uh, there are stories that fascinate you um, over these years. And, um, you know, as my... I have this hero, uh, I think one of the world's uh, greatest uh, war reporters. Her name is Martha Gellhorn. And uh, she used to say about the war, she used to say that um, uh, you probably love the first war, but the, every other war you go to becomes a responsibility. So that, about, that is what happens to a, con a reporter who is reporting from a uh, conflict zone. So when you go there as a journalist, there's this thrill attached to reporting from an area like Bastar or Kashmir or, or, or Nagaland. But after that thrill is gone, you realize that you can't uh, just go away from there. You need to stay put because there are so many, uh, there are so many stories uh, you need to say. And it changes you um, uh, in, in many ways. In my personal experience, I've never seen a, a reporter who reports from conflict area and is completely sane. Um, uh, there's, there's a small incident I'll tell you and, uh, uh, quickly. yeah, quickly, you know, in uh, two, 2001, I was uh, uh, traveling from uh, Delhi to Srinagar for some assignment and I met this uh, HD photographer called Pradeep Bhatia on my way to Delhi and we stayed in the same hotel, um, a hotel called Ahadus in the heart of Srinagar and mm -hmm. the next morning we were having breakfast. Uh, we, we stayed uh, awake the whole night, we had a bottle of rum between the two of us and we sang Kishore Kumar's songs, etc. Uh, so in the morning we were having breakfast, there was a bomb blast just outside our hotel. Uh, we came out and uh, came out rushing uh, to see what has happened. Uh, and of course a bomb blast had happened and there were two policemen who were uh, lying dead there. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a white ambassador car which was there and I took out a cigarette and I was smoking it and I kept my elbow on the uh, car and I uh, heard this voice, there's this BSF officer who is calling me. Um, and he's saying, Rahul, what are you doing? And he just keeps, my, keeps his head, uh, keeps his arm on my shoulder and just leads me sort of away from uh, that, uh, that, that particular area. And he just, 15, just a matter of 15 seconds. And suddenly, when I look at it in hindsight, it felt as if I was passing through a ball of fire. And I look behind, there's this uh, uh, commander of JNK police. His whole uh, body is in tatters. He's still holding a... AK-47 rifle in his hands, so his whole body is simmering, it's burning. So he walks from here till, uh, till the speaker and collapses. There's a 12-year-old boy uh, who is standing outside a government emporium showroom and he's so shocked with what he has seen 
uh, that he's gone under shock and he's saying, uh, I've done nothing, I've done nothing, and he's crying. And that, uh, it was another bomb blast and that, uh, that RDX explosive was kept uh, in that uh, white ambassador car on which I was, uh, I had kept my shoulder, uh, kept, kept, my, uh, kept my elbow. So this BSF officer that day saved my life. So I went away and I came back to Delhi, but uh, I mean, f for months I had nightmares after that uh, uh, incident and I thought I had gone uh, completely uh, mad. Uh, that is the time when nobody had uh, in India had heard about this really fancy term which came to us after 9-11, PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Uh, Yesterday you want to add anything yeah, and then we have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since I write um, in the format of fiction, uh, I, I try to be very objective. I'm telling two stories, I can't take sides. And also I use the liberty of fiction to move things a little. Everything is historical, everything is true. But some, somewhere I've moved the history a little. So something that happened in 2001, I've pulled it back to 1998. That, that's what I've done. I think it's important to be truthful about that. Okay. Thank you very much, Easterine and Rahul, for this very interesting session. <laughs>